Okay, I think just that was a little interesting. For those of you that have joined us so far, good evening and welcome. Um, first off, off the bat, guys, Adam, Jono, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining. It's, we all have a passion for this place called the Masai Mara. And for those people that joined, first of all, thank you so much because every single one of you paid $20 to join us and that is going straight to the Mara Conservancy. This will also be available on YouTube on multiple channels after the fact. And if you watch this after the fact, guys, the Mara Conservancy needs our help and you'll, you'll kind of find out during this conversation why. But guys, for the purposes of this discussion here, um, I'll check some of the questions. I mean, there's some people already saying that some European airports are allowing transit guests from the USA and such, but we'll dig deeper into that as we go. But for now, can I maybe just go around, Adam, Jonathan, John, just a quick one for everybody joining us. If they maybe not know who we are, just a short little version and then we'll dive right in. Adam. Oh, who am I? Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm based in Namara. I'm, I'm, I'm one of, I've been incredibly fortunate because I've actually been on lockdown in the Mara. Um, I've been here for now 130 days, consecutive days in the Masai Mara, and I have yet to be in a sighting with another car. So I've been very, That's very lucky. Unreal. <laughs> yes. I've seen, the whole, I've seen the, whole, the whole thing happen from the, the floods that we had in April and May through to the fires that we're getting now. Uh, through to the start of the wildebeest starting to trickle in but it's um yeah i'm incredibly incredibly privileged to be mm. here yeah i think i think what's going to be interesting when we get to the the whole tourism versus conservation thing the things you have seen and the lack of people during that time it's going to make for an interesting discussion as we kind of get stuck into this um jonathan most people probably know who you are but just for those of you that might not where are you currently based what are you busy with Okay, so uh, Jonathan Scott of the Big Cat People, Angela Scott, also a wildlife photographer who unfortunately is not feeling so great, but uh, I can talk for two. And uh, we live in Kenya. Angie was born in uh, Alexandria in Egypt, uh, grew up in Tanzania and is a Kenya citizen. And I came overland from London to Johannesburg in the bad old days of apartheid, 1974, sure. and uh, but came through came through East Africa, and of course for me, what I realised was that was the Africa that I'd seen on television. So Mara Serengeti, uh, you know, I couldn't wait to get back, and came back uh, 1977 after a couple of years in Botswana, which I absolutely loved, and came to live at Mara River Camp 1977 and started watching the marshlands. Crazy, crazy, and right now you you're in Nairobi right now, yes. Well, we live in Nairobi, so we have a stone cottage at Governor's Camp, uh, mm -hmm. which we come and go from. We leave one vehicle there. We've got Land, Land Rover here sitting. Uh, I've got, God help me when I try and start it because there's no batteries in it. <laughs> and uh, goodness knows. <laughs> anyway, but uh, we have a Toyota down at uh, Governor's Camp, right in the middle of Marshland Territory. Uh, but we have a beautiful home here in Nairobi. Right. And uh, I wake up. And you know, you wake up to the sound of bird song, you know, white browed robin chats, heart loves toracos, crown cranes, fish mm. eagles, and uh, we're having the time of our life. And fortunately, lots of stuff to, to work on. So, a new book, Sacred Nature, reconnecting oh, people to our planet, the second volume of, of the book that we did, and also something called the Sacred Nature Initiative, which is our, our feeling is so many people are disconnected from nature, so many people mm. don't live near nature or don't, don't realize the impact that nature has on their lives. And we would love to remind them that, hey, we are nothing without nature. I love that, that's awesome. We'll maybe dig into that a little bit later on. I think that's, that's something people might need to know about a little bit more. Um, Jono, just for everybody joining, if they might not know who Jono is and kind of your, your contribution to this conversation. Okay, so um, Jono, Wild Eye, I found a member of Wild Eye together with Jerry back in, in 2011. Um, we were lucky enough to go to the Mara in 2010. And um, on a, you know, uh, before we started our camp there, and I absolutely fell in love with it from the moment I was there. Just the feel and the people and obviously the incredible wildlife um, 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 uh, sightings. And we started a camp there, 2011 and we've been running it um, ever since based in the Mara Conservancy and somebody asked me the other day um, and Jonathan you mentioned that uh, in your um, in your video if there was one place that you would like to go on earth um, and somebody uh, somebody asked me the other day is which is the first place in Africa or is there a place in Africa that you would like to go 
And I said, you know what, guys, there obviously are a lot of places in Africa I'd like to go, but if you gave me one place in Africa that I could go on my last ever trip, it would be to the Mara. And again, it's about the people, it's about the feeling, it's about just the wide open spaces, the never ending skies, the beautiful sightings, the ecosystem, just everything about it is um, beautiful to me. And it's been beautiful for my family. I've got uh, three not so young girls anymore. My wife's into wildlife <laughs> photography as well. And, um, and they've, they've been going there, my, my girls, since they were six. And, it's, and our staff at the Wild Mara Camp are like family to them. You know, we've got a, during lockdown, we've had this um, WhatsApp chat between the staff and my family and my, you know, my girls. And it's been just so amazing that the unity and the, our Kenyan family um, and the, the bonds that we've created during that time and the value that it's added to the lives of my girls on the cult, you know, the cultures of the Maasai and obviously the other people. So um, uh, that's why I love the Mara and that's why I'm obviously hoping, hoping to do everything I can to assist in, uh, in ensuring that the Mara, the Mara is contained, conserved and, uh, and my daughters can enjoy it for years to come. And me, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, Guys, just for those of you listening and one or two that's joined in late, uh, if you have any questions, please pop it in the Q&A tab and we'll kind of deal with them every couple of minutes. We'll pop back in there. Also, if you are watching this on YouTube, please remember that you can still help us to save the Mara Conservancy and the Massa Mara. We're running a fundraiser for them and it's going really well, but there's a lot of stuff happening. So in order to kick us off here, I mean, and open forum, guys, jump in as you wish. Adam, from your side, I mean, you've been there now throughout everything. You've seen the, the, you've seen the drop off of tourism to virtually nothing. You have seen the floods come through. For you on the ground, what is the challenges that the guys are facing in real time on the ground today? Yeah, um, it's been tricky. It's been, I mean, it's been an absolute blessing to be here, but um, obviously the, the triangle, especially for the American Conservancy, they're completely reliant upon gate fees, park fees, um, tourists coming. And that dried up completely. I believe last month, they made just over $1,000 in, in gate fees. So there, are, there have been a couple of residents trickling in, but really it's nothing. If you consider that normally at this time of the year, they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I don't know if, if people watching are very familiar with, with how the park fees work, but essentially $80 for an international tourist. And then that will be split between the, the council, the, the narrow county, and, and, the, and the Conservancy, and the Conservancy gets about 45% of that. So you're looking at 36 odd dollars for every visitor. Um, now, of course, since about the 19th of March or so, somewhere around there, there really have been, there's, there's been no one coming. And that was compounded, those difficulties were compounded by the, the rain. We had almost two meters of rain, I believe. Um, we had the, the highest amount of rainfall ever recorded in this area. It broke almost every bridge, um, every culvert, every road. At one stage I was going out, I was still trying to go out every day, um, but literally there was one road left. And that's the tricky Maybe. part, there's the patrolling, the, the difficulties for the anti-poaching units, there's, it, you know, the guys have had to send people away on, on salary cuts. And so you've got the lack of income, or the, the shortcomings of income, together with the huge infrastructure damage that have mm. happened at the exact um, the perfect you know, storm, right? The perfect no. storm, and yeah, and 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 so then, so then now, as it's slowly but surely starting to kind of recover in terms of the dryness and the rain, we're still getting. I mean, I've just had an hour ago, we just had a, a deluge of rain, but it is starting to dry out now. But then, of course, we're having an almighty amount of fires now. Um, oh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's quite something. It's quite something. Literally, the entire entire ecosystem is is just on fire. A lot of those are, 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 are purposeful fires that are being lit. Some of them are coming from poachers potentially. Some of them are coming from kids who, who have no school. So I don't know if you know, but as of today, the, the government has just said that school will only start in January, um, local school. So now you've got a situation where you've got teenagers, bored teenagers, they've got another half a year. There's no online schooling happening. Mm. So it's a, it's a really, really difficult situation that we're in at the moment. Mm. Absolutely. You know, uh, I, I think a comment, it, it, just to make a very 
useful comparison to put into perspective when I think a lot of people don't realize how just how devastating a loss of tourism tourism can be on conservation in Africa. And to give you an example, 1977, when I first came to the Mara, Kenya and Tanzania were in a tussle. You know, Kenya was considered to be the sort of, you know, the pirates who dominated the tourist industry in East Africa, used their vehicles, their planes, their guides, whether they were taking people on safari in Kenya or in Tanzania, Uganda. And the Tanzanians got fed up with it and said, this is unfair, you know, you're coming currency we're not getting the benefits a lot of the money is staying outside the country and so eventually they said right we're shutting the border 1977 same year that kenya banned trophy hunting and all mm -hmm. sale of wildlife couriers they didn't open the border again until 1983 and i can remember going down there because we were able as a local resident to go across sand river into the serengeti by road you just leave your logbook and you could go in and during that time so serengeti went from so they locked down basically they shut mm -hmm. kenya out but they didn't have a plan as to how they were going to now take over the reins of tourism they weren't mm -hmm. set up for it. vehicles planes international tourism still was generally coming to nairobi and that's really what was the turning point and turned the mara into being this incredible place for visitors to come to before it was just an overnight on your way back having gone from Nairobi to Amboseli into Arusha, Lake Manyara, and Gorongora Crater, Serengeti, mm. out through San River, stay at Kikarok, head back via Lake Nukuru to Nairobi. Sure. And it was like, oh, where, where was that? You know, in terms of the Mara, because you'd seen rhino, elephants, yeah. lions, whatever. But they weren't set up for it. But the reason I mention it is that when they closed down their tourism, Serengeti, which used to get prior to that, let's say it was 100,000 tourists, it dropped to 10,000. They were no longer able to pay ranger salaries. Vehicles were just basically unable to patrol. Their poachers had an absolute field day. The elephant population, which was, let's say it was maybe two to 4,000. Anyway, it was halved. The black rhino, anything of 500 plus, was completely devastated and sure. in fact 400 elephants moved out of serengeti into the mara in the 80s because of this effect but basically you suddenly saw my god in countries like tanzania kenya and i see in in south africa a, a report and you'll be able to tell me if this was true that south african national parks rely for 75 percent of their mm -hmm. budget from tourism to run the parks. So mm -hmm. without tourism, we are stuffed. Because mm -hmm. countries like, but even having said that, I see that President Kenyatta has announced a tranche of money to go to the tourism sector because we know how difficult it is, including, and there's some debate whether it's um, $10 million or $5 million, which will go to help support the 160 wildlife conservancies in Kenya, 60 mm -hmm. of which are in the Mara, because everybody without tourism we sort of don't have a plan b we're not a rich country and this is why we're asking people to help sure. because every dollar that people contribute and certainly when it comes to the mara conservancy and of course we care about the whole mara and we're helping Absolutely. in other ways with other parts of the mara but this is specifically mara conservancy but the great thing about this is you know, we know, and our audience can be rest assured that any money raised will be used for the right purpose. Infrastructure, anti-poaching, ranger salaries, basic 100%. upkeep, keeping the show on the road. 100%. Now, just for, I mean, for Adam and Jonathan, John, if we can jump in with our staff as well. The, the spin-off of this from a tourism point of view and COVID basically just stopping tourism. This is going to spin further than just now and six months. There's a whole timeline that's going to happen here. The other thing that's also involved, and look, we're throwing a lot on the table, but let's dissect, is the local communities and the people that work in these areas. I mean, at our Mara camp, we've got 16, maybe 20 staff. And for us, but look at the lodges, look at the ranges, look at the anti-poachers. How far does this thing really go? Sure. Yeah, it's a, a huge ripple effect. Um, I know in the, in the Mara, a lot of the camps have, have, have been shut and 
and they're not opening, even though internationals are, are allowed back on the 1st of August, there are a lot of camps that won't open 1st of August. And it's a, it, it's, it's a false idea if you think that on the 1st of August, the planes are all going to be full and the Mara is going to be full again. There is going to be a, a long delay. It could even be, could be a year, could be longer that it takes yeah. before people are, are confident enough of the health system for them to come back. There's obviously a lot of people in, employed in the, in the, in the, in the landscape. I, I don't know, John, I might know better in terms of the numbers of, of um, Maasai households who are, who are paid rent, but I think it's somewhere in the 15,000 like, families that are dependent yeah. upon the conservancy. Yeah. Um, yeah, lots and lots. And I think, a, a, a bit, and just to interject and then you carry on, the other thing everybody needs to get is for every Kenyan in employment, they are probably helping a family of five, maybe even 10 people, sisters, aunts, brothers. Mm. So that one job, and let's say tourism in Kenya, I don't know, let's say it's a quarter of a million people employed, you know, part of the sector. Well, you're talking a million in terms of the effect that those jobs actually, you know, the finance is the money that trickles back. So whatever you hear, if it's 15,000, uh, you know, then you better believe that actually, you know, it's double, if not triple that. Mm in terms of people who are dependent on that individual salary. Sorry, yeah. over to you. No, and this is something that is, I mean, it might not be topical for this conversation, but maybe it is, is that they recently released the, um, the growth rate, the human population growth rate in the Mara. Mm -hmm. And oh. it's, so, so the national Kenyan average is, I wrote it down, the national, the national is 2.8% is growth rate. The, the Mara, the population on the periphery of the Mara is 10.5%. Population yeah. growth rate. Yeah. So you're talking wow. a critically young and booming population, of which their parents are almost all employed in tourism. And you've got this now on the periphery of the park, you've got a whole group of unemployed or, or reduced in their employment and youngsters. Mm -hmm. And so it, it has been the perfect storm. And But in a way, it was good that it happened while the flooding was that bad, because if, if tourists had been here during those floods, it would have been worse. Um, we would have had a lot more trouble, I think, but the money would have come in. Um, so yeah, so it's tricky, but I, I don't know if we'll really understand the ripple effect for a, for a while. Um, I think it'll start to materialize in months to come, but hopefully yeah. with the migration being slightly late this year and still, still possibly gonna arrive in, in good numbers, then hopefully that'll, there'll be some kind of little tail to the, to the high season to get something on the books mm -hmm. for all these camps. Mm -hmm. And just to forecast for them, you know, is I'm, my biggest concern, particularly from our business, is how many lodges are actually going to survive this, this whole, you know, there's obviously certain lodges that have, um, have created uh, uh, cash, cash flows and they're going to be able to see themselves through this, through this period. But I'm sure there's going to be a lot of lodges that may not be able to see themselves through this period. So... Less lodges, less people employed, less tourists. Um, you know, and what are the jobs that are lost? <coughs> the people that live on the peripheries. Um, what are they going to have to resort to 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 make ends meet? And is that livestock, additional livestock? And we know the pressure the Mara is under from livestock coming into the Mara. Um, you know, it's it's you know what are yeah. the, the long term or medium term effects of this could be fairly dramatic and could could last for a a very long time. Yeah, so, and so I, I, I was just talking to Jan Mohammed, who's the uh, CEO of the Serena group of hotels who have yeah. Serena mm -hmm. Lodge in the Mara Triangle. So one of the uh, places of accommodation on a lovely uh, hill overlooking some of the famous Mara River uh, crossing sites for the wildebeest. So I was talking to Jan and I just, when I spoke to him, I hadn't spoke to him for months. And when I spoke to him, it was like, and I hope you'll forgive me for this, but it was like speaking to a totally different person. He, he was so deflated by the situation. I mean, in Nairobi, Serena, um, I, Mara Safari Club, in, in Nairobi, sorry, Nairobi Safari Club, uh, mm -hmm. The Norfolk. I mean, I think a lot of these, uh, maybe the New Stanley, a lot of these have history. So it is a hugely challenging period. And we are going to need huge support, both in terms of people's lives 
and in terms of conservation. And of course, they are joined at the hip. You know, so mm -hmm. this is the big thing. What's the, what is the relationship between the people, the local community and the wildlife? How is this? Are they going to feel pro-wildlife or are they going to think yeah. if there's no runny money coming from it, well, then we might as well utilize it, whether it's for meat poaching, whether it's rhino, elephant. But fortunately, up to this point, I read somebody's comment today in East Africa, certainly, I could, let's, let's talk about Kenya. I don't, or I haven't heard, maybe Adam knows better. Um, I haven't heard that there's been, um, you know, rhino, elephant poaching to any great degree. But as I wrote just recently, believe me, if people aren't out there, and of course, one of the things that protects the Mara is 300,000 visitors a year. Well, that's been the kind of peak figure they've enjoyed at times. Um, it's not just having the rangers and the patrols out there. The reason it was a lot easier to monitor the Mara is because there's so many eyes and ears during the daytime in terms of mm. visitors, drivers, people like that. So that's helped keep poaching in check. But the bad guys will see this as an opportunity for so, sure. 100%. So I, I, we're with me, we're with me, because I've been here, because I've been driving around every day. Um, I've been, I've been quite surprised, pleasantly surprised, at how the Conservancy has managed to deal with poaching. Um, there, it is happening. I know last, last month there were 12 arrests. There was, I mean, there was a few days ago they managed to catch some guys, but they were fishing. It's, but it's been quite small. It's been quite um, guys just looking for food or looking for a few dollars, really. Um, the one incident mm -hmm. which, I, which I managed to see, actual guys, the whole thing happening was, Guys <clears throat> caught a hippo, and they were going to sell the meat from a hippo for five hundred dollars. There were five of them, so that's a hundred dollars each. Um, and that's quite—I mean, that's quite good money. But five hundred dollars a hippo—that puts a, a monetary value on on a poached hippo, which I was pre previously very unaware of. Mm. But the fact that there have been so few uh, poachers caught in the conservancy in this during this lockdown period speaks volumes for what um, Brian Heath and the conservancy have been able to do with a very small team with very, very difficult, um, very limited resources. Um, and so mm -hmm. fortunately, touch wood, fortunately, the rhino elephant stuff hasn't materialized in Kenya like it has in, in, in South Africa throughout the last few mm -hmm. years, actually. You know, one, um, of the things, one of the things, Adam, that I think may account for that is, and when uh, Jono was saying, you know, he had to say, even though there are some amazing Southern African parks, it's different. The Mara and parts of the Serengeti, it's the visibility, it's the accessibility, the yeah. openness of landscape, which allows you to spot, you know, another car or a cheetah or a leopard, and they probably two go together, or lions from miles away, and which allows Cheetah One, the patrol vehicle yeah. in the Mara Triangle, to do its job. And, and just people know, oh, there's the rangers, keep, be careful how mm. you go off road or don't. Um, because visibility is so good. And that, of course, again, helps with the poaching because certainly, you know, when it comes to meat poaching, if it's going to be wildebeest, zebras, you need to set snares, well, you need bush or a log. You need something to attach it to. And the poachers do not want to be out in the open. They want to tuck themselves traditionally along the rivers, along the luggers, the intermittent water courses. Those are their hideout places. And of course, but the trouble is, if there is not sufficient patrols they will begin as they did in serengeti to literally camp in the wilderness area along by the rivers they will come in and out with donkeys bicycles even ferrying the meat and to give you an example so there was a good one adam gave about 500 bob 500 shillings mm. five dollars for a hippo no, five, five hundred, and you're talking 500 oh, five, 500 shillings or, 500 dollars Oh, five hundred dollars. Okay, that that makes it a bit more, you know. For but even so, it's a two-ton animal, and it's mainly, you know, fat and, and and usable stuff. But the thing that we found out, you know, from the records in Serengeti, and there's always been an argument how many wildebeest were actually being snared, and people said between thirty and a hundred thousand. Who knows? But it was Ooh. tens of thousands. Yep, as they moved into the western corridor, came mm. off the plains, and the poachers could snare them. They reckoned that that was run on a commercial basis to the fact that the meat from Serengeti, the wildebeest zebra, and in earlier times decimated the buffalo population, was servicing a million 
people living around Lake Victoria in Tanzania, Kenya, the, the roots would need people. So, you know, quite something. Yeah. There, there is another, just, just to, to, to shift back to the focus of, of, of tourism. And I'm fascinated to see how this will play out because there's some countries in Africa that have set their safari industry on a very, very high end scale. Yeah. So Rwanda yeah. and Botswana. Um, they are completely reliant upon the $2,000 per night kind of figure of, of people coming in from the States. Mm -hmm. They might not have invested so much in their domestic tourism. Kenya, I think, <clears throat> I think what, might be a savior, what might be a savior for Kenya in the next month or two is that Kenya has actually got quite a traditionally um, good domestic tourism market. The guys from Nairobi like to travel. And now, now, that, now that Nairobi opened up yesterday, um, I think we're going to see the domestic travel might prop up um, the shortcomings. Maybe it's not enough. Maybe, it, maybe it'll be a change that we don't know. But I do think I'm very interested to hear how countries like Botswana and Rwanda are going to, are going to deal with this exact post mm. or, or happening Many, that, that kind of relapse mm. of the... Sure. Just as a, I mean, as, a, as a look at tourism throughout Africa, I mean, everything stopped throughout the high end, the low end, local, everything. And now with it slowly opening up, there's always been from some people saying that, oh no, I don't, and, and we've heard this, I don't want to go to the Mara, there's too many people there. But we've told them you can manage it. You can go to certain places, certain areas, so it's doable. Is this a way, I mean, with everything having been forced to a standstill, and now we have to kind of have a good hard look at where everything was and is and going to, is this a way for us to look at the Mara and say, right, was it too many? Can we take more? How can we manage it? Th that balance of more tourism, getting the money in without compromising the experience for the guests and obviously the ecosystem. Where does this sit? Difficult. Very, very difficult question. <laughs> and now that, I think, I think, had, you, had you spoken to the four, had the four of us had this meet, this conversation a year ago, we would have said increase the park fees, make, make, because we're undervaluing yep. the Mara. We're taking 100%. probably one of the greatest spectacles in the world and we're, we're undervaluing it. Yep. My fear, my, my, my fear is that in order to get any guests that are, can possibly come in at the moment, that a lot of the lodges throughout, throughout the world actually, but a lot of the lodges in the Mara are going to undercut themselves and they're going to undervalue themselves just to get something, which I completely understand because they haven't paid pay, pay, pay for very things. But I think that it is going to cause a long-term step backwards in the undervaluing of, our, of, of one of the, the greatest resources in Kenya. Mm. But I tell you a, a, an interesting point which, which came through when you talk about high end as a go, as you know, opposed to low end tourism or mass tourism, which the Mara was always, I mean, Kenya as a, as a whole has been viewed mm -hmm. as a mass tourism destination as opposed to a Botswana where it was more expensive and, and Kenya did make the change and we've got various high end camps, obviously high end lodges like uh, Angama where Adam is. And I read an interesting thing the other day um, in one of the articles that were shared, uh, I think by Calvin Cotter about, you know, the new reality for tourism. And one person made a very good point, which may actually point us towards certain ways in which we try to encourage people to come back on safari. And that was that possibly some of the more, the smaller, more bespoke operations would be able to manage their visitors much more safely than somewhere with 200 people bustling in and out of a reception, much closer together, mass dining halls and, and I thought you know what that actually is a very you know very good idea now you could say oh but that's going to be elitist but we are dealing with you know a pandemic right now we're dealing with trying to run economies when we know right. that it's still a dangerous thing and so I think whatever way the tourist industry reacts and maybe Jono can uh, you know give us some ideas as to you know when or what he perceives how when visitors come to camps and lodges you know, how are we going, you know, social distancing, masks, how, how are we going to, you know, hold this thing together? Because we've seen, you know, Melbourne, uh, the United States, if you just open up, I mean, and our president has said, you know, people have got to act responsibility. And if they don't, we'll shut down again. 
But we know still also that countries have to actually run economies. So, Jono, I don't know what you you feel. What kind of, how are you going to manage well, Okay, from our point of view, you know, we, we have a, a smallish camp which um, has 12 people max in it. Um, we've already spoken about setting up the camp a little bit differently where there's more distancing. We'll only, we've got four vehicles, so with 12 people, we only have three people in a long wheelbase vehicle. I think that's going to be a big thing for lodges now is only having four people on a vehicle where ordinarily they could have had up to up to 10 on a vehicle. Um, but, I th you know, I, I, we're looking also at the positive. I think there's a lot of people that are looking post-COVID to go back to nature and back to, uh, you know, to the, to the outdoors instead of going to a massive hotel in uh, a big resort somewhere in the world, you know, um, an exclusive use. A lot of the lodges are now talking about people that will travel more with family and friends um, to single destinations for long, longer periods um, in or of a, you know, Londa Lozi, for example, they're driving this and they've got um, certain of their camps that only have eight people, so they're getting starting to look at punting where people can book that private camp for eight people, only those eight people in the vehicle. They know more or less it's family and friends and stuff, um, instead of mixing with people where you're not necessarily aware of where they've come from, have they been, been exposed. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, positives that I think will come out of it um, from, a, from our camp point of view. Um, where people will look to take exclusive use of a vehicle, have exclusive dining, have only you know um, their tents next to each other, where they don't necessarily need to mingle with, with other guests. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff on COVID um, practices and with, from a staff point of view with masks and sanitizing and, and all that sort of stuff, which you know we obviously are getting up to speed on that. But it's, it's never going to be the norm. Um, and I've always said, and um, from the outset when this thing broke, I've always said um, the new, the north, we will travel again, and most people will travel again when we have a vaccine. And a lot of people are com are coming with the same sentiments. You know, we had a lot of people saying to us, July, August, we're going to be traveling again. You guys must be ready. Blah blah blah. And I just said. Without a vaccine, this thing is going to run. It's going to, and I never predicted it will run to what it is. But without a vaccine, you know, our people that travel, you know, Adam, your average age group of people that travel, you know, ours is probably more 50, 60, um, a lot, 80% from the US. And, mm. you know, they said they don't want to travel. And I can understand they don't want to travel, you know. Um, but they will travel again. But the, uh, you know, as I say, I think there's going to be a positive where a lot more people are going to want to return to nature in a smaller camp and um, in the middle of the outdoors where, you know, the risk of cross-contamination from mingling with hundreds of people will be... Um, you know, and the, you know, the risk yeah. will be you know I, I think, sorry, Adam, uh, just an interesting point there that actually in the housing market, and, and I was told this by some friends in England, actually people, you know, even though you might think, oh my goodness, you know, nobody's going to be selling or buying properties. One of the <laughs> things the estate agents are saying is people are actually beginning to value nature and a bit of green space and getting out and, uh, you know, a mm. house with a garden. And of course, not everybody can afford it. But I think hopefully it will create a nature fix and a demand for a nature <coughs> fix, whether it's in your backyard, um, you know, or coming on safari. And, and I mean, let's face it, Jono and I, were, okay, so Adam, I'm sure would be the same, you know, the Mara, it, there's nowhere on earth like the Mara. And I think that, you know, I would always say to people, if, if I had to say, and yes, I, I love Botswana, I love Londolozi, you know, places all over the, all over Africa, all over wilderness destinations. But there's three things about the Mara. Fantastic asset, uh, accessibility. You can get to where the animals are. So yeah. great and, and open, amazing for photography. So you've got great access. You can get, and, and the variety of, you know, whether it's big cats, you can see all the big cats. Um, but just in general, the 
plethora of, of, of wildlife, whether it's elephants, buffalo, impala, topi, you name it, it's all right there. And, uh, you know, th there's nowhere like it. So I would never want anybody not to, if they could, have a chance to come to the Mara. But we need to be sensible and decide when that's going to be. And mm. we also obviously need to be looking at we're talking about the Mara Triangle, which we know is, you know, got the Mara Conservancy uh, with their rangers and wardens. They've got a management plan. They, they create infrastructure. They monitor visitors, no more than five off-road at any time. You don't have the pandemonium that you see on the other side, uh, although sometimes at river crossings. But one of the good things that actually I'm really excited about is that it was recently announced by Kenya Wildlife Service Nature Kenya, so that's big government, that's our main government, and Narok County who manage the reserve, that we, they are going to be looking to try and uh, achieve world heritage status for the Mara, which they attempted, but it never was, they never went completely through the paperwork before or decided they mm. weren't ready for it. And they, it would be ratified in two years time, 2022, if it came through. But obviously, the reason why the Mara isn't a World Heritage Site, even though all of us know it should be in terms of the incredible value of it as an ecosystem, is because there are some questions as to, you know, too many visitors, you know, what's the impact of cattle coming into the reserve, you know, what's going to be. But the good news is this, that in applying, and Narok, KWS, everybody is determined to try to do this, in trying to get the right requirements, it would mean a cohesive management plan mm -hmm. for the whole of the Mara. It would mean a, a serious limitation on cattle encroachments. And it would mean, I imagine, a enforceable moratorium on the development of any more camps and lodges. If we achieve those three, three things in the name of trying to get ratified as a world heritage site, which we know we are name, then that will have done a great service to make long term. So thumbs up from me on that. Yeah. Mm. Just yeah, you know, one of the questions I've I've you know, let's go five years down the track and everything's back to normal. There's a vaccine, everyone's traveling. You know, from a from a conservation point of view, and you know, we the chat we're having an ecotourism point of view is the number of people in, in the Mara, particularly during high season, and how that affects maybe bilbius crossings. You know, there's always been a lot of negative um, um, comments made, not necessarily from only our guests, but from a lot of people on social media and stuff. How do you think the best way is to control that? Is it increasing park fees? To reduce the number of people? Is it um, um, having a tier system on park fees where people that pay a certain price can go to um, uh, certain crossing points and others can't if they, you know, the, uh, Adam, we, you know, the, I know that we've had the gold, silver and bronze sort of park fee type thing where, where um, people will have preference to get to certain crossing points and access to certain areas and potentially have to be able to walk, uh, walk in certain areas. Is that the answer going forward? Or, I mean, is it going to take a long time where I would, I would presume that um, the authorities are going to say, listen, we're not going to back the trend because after a few years of um, very little income, we need to recover and still keep the, the park fees the same. Yeah. Adam, Adam, you go first because I had quite a long chat there and then, <laughs> then I'll, come, I'll come in with something <laughs> extra on the back you say i would i would have said Jono, had you asked me you know my i i'm quite strong in the opinion that, that the park fees should have been more um and they should have aimed to essentially halve the number of people and double the amount of, of money each person is paying and therefore everyone it's all happy but i am very very aware now that that, that might not be be possible um because of what's happened and, and my greatest fear my greatest fear out of this whole thing which uh, is that we now on the situation where we're going to put private vehicles out for everyone or put four in a car and that's all now but then that's going to become the new the new norm and so when people come in post corona the safari industry is what we might, might what we might be doing is we might be producing a system where there are more cars um mm -hmm. where our, our long-term goal was to reduce the number of cars 
But now if we're going to put two or four people in one car, the same number of people might come and therefore we've got a huge number more cars. So that could be a long-term difficulty that we're about to go through is how to manage the car numbers going post-corona. But mm -hmm. we're at, normally, I would say, yes, the, the tiered system is how I would solve the, the Mara personally. I would, I would have the different areas that you pay, different park fees, and basically bring that, that, that thing that, that you are paying a lot of money to be in one of the greatest natural ecosystems in the world, and you must pay for that privilege. But if, you're a lo but if you're a local Kenyan and you've got this on your doorstep and this is part of your history, part of who you are, part of your culture, then you also have a right to go and see it. And so, so that is the only way that a tiered system can work, in, in, in mm. my opinion. But it, it is, uh, this whole system may, may have been stunted a little bit, may have taken a, a, a knock back, um, but that's, that's how I would have done it. Jono. Okay, so, yeah, so, so Adam, I mean, I, I'm sure Jono and, and all of you maybe know, or maybe you don't, but I, as far as I know, the Minister of Tourism announced that they were halving yeah, the not park. For, not, not for, so yes, he was. For KWS, though. Yeah, for KWS, so not for the Okay, so, so not, but I wouldn't be surprised if maybe uh, the Mara followed suit. Let, let's see. But yeah, yeah carry on. But I was saying that when I, when I heard that, my instant thing was, okay, it, if it's the Mara, I think it's a mistake to have done it for the internationals. Mm. I, I don't necessarily think it's a mistake for have done it to the locals because allow them to come. And, and this, this system is going to be propped up by the domestic tourists for the next few months. And Kenyans need to help and Kenyans need to support the, the Mara. But long term, so when, he, when they said a year with the, with the reduced fees, internationals are, are going to travel anyway. They're either going to travel or they're not going to travel. That extra... $40 <laughs> is a huge difference for the guys managing the roads, the guys who are trying to build the bridges. That all adds up. So I would have said that was a mistake, but it hasn't happened for the Mara. It isn't, it isn't happening in the Mara, from what I hear. Yeah. Well, just, just to give you a little bit of an analogy, the wildlife conservancies, the private land bordering the reserve itself, where, you know, Mara North, uh, Alari Motorogi, where there are some camps, where there's a partnership between the landowners, the Maasai, uh -huh. who get a monthly lease, tour operators, and where they have the basic proviso, and there's 16 of those conservancies functional in and around the Mara, and those ones um, basically run on a plan, a model of sustainable tourism, which is one bed, one bed night per 700 acres. Now, the reserve, by comparison, I was told when they were looking at the management plan, I think was like four times that. So in other words, four times beyond overcapacity by comparison to what was considered to be the required, you know, ecologically friendly model. So we all know that there is too many vehicles crowding too many places and it puts huge pressure on predators, river crossings. And so everybody has been saying, what are we going to do about it? Well, if it hadn't been for the pandemic, which may actually, and I'm sure it will, there will be quite a few of the camps and lodges which simply will not be able to open, where they will already have abandoned their ideas of being tour operators because they came in on the back of a, a wave of optimism and money and let's go out and buy a land cruiser and start taking people on safari. You know, a lot of local Maasai started to do that and more power to them if they could actually get a foot in the tourism industry. But the downside of that is you've got two choices. If you are going to continue to say that whatever the rules, whatever the management plan, we are going to continue to have overcapacity by sound ecological sense, then you must enforce strict management, which is what the Mara Conservancy does. And actually, even though it would be quite difficult, if you had the Mara Conservancy model with the discipline of the rangers employed to do those jobs on the other side of the river, enforcing the rules, it would be a totally different scenario. It wouldn't be perfect by any means, because it's like, you know, a, a traffic cop trying to control traffic and, you know, in rush hour, it would be rush hour, but people would simply just have to wait their turn and you wouldn't have 20, 30 vehicles around a leopard making a complete monster out of the mm. scenario and totally disrespecting the wildlife. Nobody wants to see that, which is why the conservancies 
the one, not the Myra Conservancy, which is the management company running the triangle, but the wildlife conservancies, the private land, people like, uh, you know, Perini Camp, for instance, uh, you know, in the Alari Motorogi and the, uh, uh, I can't quite remember. Yeah, I think they're in the Alari Motorogi uh, Conservancy. Uh, but the Perini camps there, I see that, you know, because they're struggling so much, they're fantastic places to see wildlife, probably better than many parts of the reserve for leopards and cheetahs now, because there's more bush. The elephants haven't had as much impact and climate change, whatever it might be, fires. In the Maasai areas, there's more bush, better for some of the cats. But I know that they are really struggling. And Perini, for instance, are offering, you know, um, what do they call it? Sponsor an acre of land. You can go on their website and check it out. There's a number of these, uh, you know, ideas to try and support the conservancies in the interim. Sponsor an acre of land for a year to help keep the conservancies alive. So I think basically discipline, and I'm hoping that in the not too distant future, we will find that there is a coherent management plan with enforced regulations like we have, no more than five cars at a sighting. And if there's more than that, sorry, you're gonna to have to go away. You'll have to either wait or you'll go somewhere else. And even though Adam's idea of zoning and tiers is a great one, it was in the original management plans and it was, it was shelved. Now I would love to see, because we've slightly cleared the slate, now mm. whereby a lot of operators won't be operating maybe there will be a chance to rewrite the plan and the regulations because one thing's for sure nobody would not want to come to the mara and have a safari i don't want to talk about this management plan sorry i'm going to sorry to yeah. button here um, just for the sake of the people that are, are listening i mean what if you know that management plan has been on the table and it's been on it would probably a lot of people's inboxes as well and uh, politicians in boxes for a while. What is, what is that? Um, okay, so uh, the management, so basically there was a time in the early 200, 2000s where mm -hmm. management plans were created for national game reserves, in particular Amboseli and the Masai Mara. And they were and of high-end, um, you know, high-end, low-use areas, which would be along the Mara River ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So sensitive areas, you know, small camps, not big camps, and less congestion, which would give you less congestion at river crossings. You'd be paying more and you would have access to that. Now, that would be one way. Less camps, and if you happen to be one at the river crossings, you're paying more, you get the river crossings. Or you could do what Adam's saying, you know, maybe like with the, the bears in, in Alaska at Brook Falls, where you, you know, hey, there's nothing like the wildebeest migration. Maybe there has to be an annual lottery and you up the stakes and you pay yeah. and you get, you get a chance to actually then have your chance at the migration. So there were all those kind of ideas. But the management plan basically zoned. So high end, low impact and then high density tourism where you paid less. And the, the area, the, the plan had its zoning. Anyway, it wasn't approved. It also had all kinds of other security, you know, off-road driving, proper management, this, 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 this. And for all the different reasons you can imagine, it hasn't yet been implemented, but that's why I'm delighted that trying to actually get adhere to the regulations or the requirements of world heritage status is that we will see significant changes in the Mara. I am sure of it. Yeah. I, I want to add something that's, that's a little bit off that, but something that, because I know that most of the people listening will be photographers, especially you know, with wild eye. <laughs> and I've, I've um, come across a lot of people in my time. I've, visit, I've visited, I'm now sitting at almost 90, 90 lodges in the Mara that I've been to to talk to, to talk to the people. Um, and a lot of the people, criticize the conservancy for being so managed that they can't break the rules to get the photographs. And it's, it's, it's this incredible thing that each, each of you listening, I want you, to, I want you to think to yourself and say, is a photograph worth, worth taking? And that my biggest fear about the opposition to on the other side of the river to, have, to being well managed is that the photographers wouldn't be able to go there and break the rules to get those photographs. And that, I mean, it's off topic a little bit, but it is something that I said, I want to ask you, Jerry, about your, um, your thoughts on when you have guests who push you to the limits 
to get a photograph because the Mara has been so over photographed that you have to get new angles, new, new ideas, new ways of showing things. And so it's, it's a fascinating point that in itself, I think. Absolutely. I mean, I think from a, from a photography, if we just go photography straight up point of view, the one thing that, and this is since we, we started, we've always approached it as not wildlife photography as an end goal. It's the experience of wildlife photography. So because of that, the experience of the Mara for us and our guests trumps that. Yes, you're going to walk away with great images and you're going to see amazing things, but they come back for the people, for the wildlife. So the, the discussion of what you're saying now of certain areas, you can go break the rules here, but you can't put a tripod down here or you can use, I don't know, you can get out the car here and do it there. That does come up, but I think it's up to us as facilitators and hosts of these trips to educate people on, specifically because we're, we're focused on the moral conservancy where we're based, that this is why you cannot do it here. And therefore, it is better because we play along with the rangers. And we say to the rangers, listen, um, this is what we try and do. Sometimes we try, I mean, honestly, we, we ask them and say, hey, listen, can we not? No, you can't. Okay, cool. But, but the, the guests appreciate the honesty and the understanding of what the moral conservancy is, what the rangers are trying to protect and what we are trying to support. So it does come up often, but it, it comes back to just being real about where you are and what you're doing. That's it, 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 what we've been based on since the beginning. Hmm. Big deal. You know, um, in, in, terms, in terms of the photography, um, I, I mean, I, I have to say, you know, I get so depressed and disgusted at times with some of the stuff that's going on out there. And I think sadly it is driven by photography and, and not just by people with big lenses, but now mm. iPhone, now everybody is a photographer. Yeah, everybody's a photographer and everybody is capturing the moment. Everybody wants to show they were there. I mean, it, th there's a picture we got, you know, uh, one time at a crossing and you got people all out of their vehicle standing with their mm. backs to the wildebeest not even looking. It's like, somebody yeah. in the, it's like somebody in the back of the car looking at the, getting a suntan when there's a leopard mm. in the tree. You know, what are you yeah. here for? Okay, that's your business. But, you know, it's like, what a waste of money. So at the river crossings, with their back to the wildebeest, taking selfies. Everybody out of their car, complete <laughs> chaos. I, you know, and I think we have to take responsibility and each of us individually have to do that. 100%. As photographers, as photographers, and we have to lay down the law with our guests. And I used to do a lot of driver's training in the, in the 80s. Uh, started the program at Kitchwatembo for driver training. And you know, it's, it's really hard on the drivers, the local driver guides, because they're under so much pressure. If you've got Big a time. chaotic situation, how can they possibly say no to their guests? Because it's going to mean they're gonna to have to drive away. Okay, as Adam knows, there's ways of briefing your drivers so as you've warned the guests before you go out there, and I think this is such an important thing to do. We, you know, brief them. So now here we are in the Mara. We may get to a chance to see river crossings. We may see leopards. But let's just get, get some ground rules here. So as we don't have to say to you when you're out there, oh, no, please don't sit on the roof. Oh, no, please don't get out of the car. Oh, no, please keep your voice down. All of these basic ways of behaving. If you've warned the people beforehand, now, when you're at the leopard sighting and you notice because your uh, driver or, or your uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. says, oh, look, somebody's sitting up on the roof. You can then just tap the person's leg and say, sorry, you can't do that. Now, they don't feel offended when you tell them because you've actually, it's like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry, I forgot. And now you can start to become the good guys because everybody else is behaving badly and you guys actually are being doing a nice job. But I think the photography situation has become out of hand. And I think that there is way too much pressure on the animals and it's at times just ugly. So mm. to come to the Mara Triangle by comparison, yes, you have to stay on the road, but you can go off. Okay, admittedly, 10 minutes, now you've got to move on a little bit like in South Africa, a rotation. But the mm. fact is you become a little bit saner. It goes so crazy in the other way of doing it that now you come to the triangle, you've got to quieten down a bit. And as Adam would say, 
look around you at the wonder of the place that you're in. And this is to me is, is something which I, I would love people to go away with. This is not entertainment. You know, I remember a Buddhist monk saying to me when I was in Bhutan filming the, yeah. the Paro festival, I was so excited about getting the shot of these people. That, and he said, you know, Jonathan, he said, this isn't meant to be entertainment. This is something, you know, this is a really emotional, important event. Well, when the wildebeest are crossing, they're risking their lives. When a mother cheetah is carrying a cub and you put her under yeah. pressure, you could lose the life of that cheetah cub. You've got to take responsibility. We have to regain a sense of respect and courtesy around mm. the animals. It shouldn't be showbiz. 100%. I could have been more. Yeah, I've had hate mail. I've had threatening mail I have had from you thinking mm -hmm. the policeman of Namara and blah 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 and you know I just it goes over my shoulder because you know to me just some of the behavior at some times it just yeah. leaves me dumbfounded and incenses me so much but we as stakeholders we need to be controlling that yeah. and whether people like you or they don't like you you're doing it for the well-being from cons for conservation and and, and the more, and, and, you know, the problem comes in where there's a lot of people that are coming into the park that get, and I sometimes feel like because they get hammered by the guests and they go, 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 go and their tips might depend on it and that sort of thing. But there's, there's got to be a higher, in my into level of training and you have to have a certain level of training um, of you know, bring, being able to bring guests into the morrow. Like if you're in a reserve in South Africa, you've got to have certain reserves. You've got to have a Fugasa one at least to be able, so you have an understanding of animal behavior, have an understanding of conservation. You have a, you know, you have an understanding of the basics of, of mm. how to conduct yourself while you're on safari. Whereas you get a guy mm. that there's high season, so we've got a vehicle, we've got these guests, there's a map, there's the Mara, off you go, you know, and they don't know the first thing about what goes on at the Wilderness Crossing or mm -hmm. at a leopard sighting. They just want to get their guests to see that leopard, you know. So I think there's a, you know, it goes further than just the, um, the, the, the tourism numbers, it's the people that are accommodating and how, how educated they are to be able to do the right thing and understand. Mm -hmm. Um, animal behavior and what's, what's good or bad. And also saying that I feel quite, I mean, like, like John, John was saying there about this isn't just show business, this isn't like we're not, I think sometimes I think we, people think we're here to see animals perform for us. And my biggest, I don't, I don't have an answer on this one, but one of the things that I, I continually think about is that our emphasis has always been on promoting tourism um, at the expense of, of conservation. And it should be the complete other way around. So if you imagine a pyramid and at the bottom of the pyramid this, where this foundation is sitting tourism, and we've seen how Corona has pulled that foundation away and conservation is higher up and it's kind of trickling down. Whereas the foundation should be the conservation and tourism should be sitting on top. So if you remove tourism, that foundation sits solid. And I, I don't have the answer, but I think it's fascinating for everyone at home to be thinking about the fact that we're all in the tourism industry, all of us. But tourism shouldn't be the reason that the Mara exists. Mm. And I think we need to all remember that the, the Mara doesn't exist for our enjoyment. The Mara exists for the animals to do their thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's plenty to talk about that, but, but that's something that does feel, I feel strongly about. You know, Adam, I think, um, I, I think Jono brought up a very good point. Um, there's always been this issue of, there are some driver guides out there who have no training, as somebody would say, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of, they've just, they're opportunists. They've seen the opportunity to make some money. There mm. aren't sufficient protocols which say, and, and I blame, and, and this is where you guys, Agama, obviously set and, and, and beyond uh, governor's camp, you know, I know they have driver's training. The tourism industry itself needs a wake up call. They, they need people, we, we need, you know, we're very fractured in terms of our tourist industry, in terms of, you know, we're not pulling together and saying, the Mara is our bread and butter. It is priceless. Mm -hmm. We must nurture it as opposed to how much money can we make out of it. 
Can we build another wing, you know, add another, another camp, another lodge, whatever it is. We, we, so better drivers training and guiding and a, an association of Mara driver guides who mm -hmm. then have a, a guide's license, which I know, I know Brian Heath at one time wanted a minimum of a bronze standard Kenya Professional Guides Association license to allow people to come into the triangle side. And the government at the time, I think, felt maybe this is a little too soon. We haven't got our act together, but we're going to. But definitely driver training, hugely important, that the lodges and camps should take responsibility for that. I don't want to hear from, you know, a, a camp or lodge owner, but that's one of my best drivers. We always get rave reports from the guests. You know why? Because he's driving right up under the tree where the leopard is, or he's driving mm -hmm. right to the mouth of the den where the wild dog is. You may think he's a great driver, but actually, you know, and, and I've been a driver guide myself. So we know what, we know the form, but actually policing, proper regulated, proper standards for the driver guides, the tour operators and the lodge owners to take responsibility for that and take it seriously and like Agama and beyond, take pride in the quality of their guiding. So as the guides mm. feel, you know, we don't want the guides to feel that they're just drivers. It's a great profession, but we've always lagged behind Southern Africa in terms of our credentials. I know in Southern Africa, you've got to spend a year or something, you know, to become a, sure. a driver guide, whereas in as we say, you can just buy a car and drive to the Mara and carry people around. Yeah. We, we mm. have to change that mindset. Mm. It's a continuous education thereof. I mean, like Angama and beyond, what we do with our guys is the, the, the lodge owners and managers have to educate the guides. The guides have to educate their guests. I mean, the amount of time that we've sat with an incredible, an incredible line sighting, and it might be too sensitive, or the cubs come out and they're stressed, or whatever the case is, where we say to the guests, listen, guys, we need to go now. And then they ask why. That why is the goal. Because now you can explain to them, listen, yeah. this needs to be sustainable. If we stay with these cats, we're going to stress them and X, Y, and Z could happen. But we need to educate them to the point where those people can go home and educate even further. We've got profiles on social media. We need to use that to educate. And it is that fine line. Adam, like you're saying, it's the, the conservation tourism thing that we all, always try and educate online very much like, look at this nice lion image, come to the Mara and I will show it to you. And I think it's our responsibility, especially now with things changing and the slate being clean and say, listen, come with me to the Mara. You know what? Leave your camera at home, but let's go there in order to give back and to see what's happening so we can share the stories and we're giving the money, we're giving the, the park fees per day. It's, to me, it's that education from camp managers to guides to guests and out to the bigger world. We have to start getting this education out. But, but, you know, a very, a very good point there, which I think is a priority, which I think Adam sort of hinted at is, you know, it's no good just being able to tell people about the animals and birds and behavior. A big mm -hmm. part of what you do, you, the, the driver guide is probably the most important part of the whole package. You're going to be, mm. as a guest, with your driver guide far longer than you will be in your lodge or camp, hopefully. Yeah. You'll be out nearly yeah. all day. I know you will if you're with Wild Eye. But the big thing is management of your guests. Because, again, we need the driver guides to take responsibility for their guests and not have a situation, which you see in the Mara, where basically the guests are in charge of the, of the game drive. It shouldn't Absolutely. be that way. Because... You don't, you don't have the experience and you will get carried away with the photograph and you need that gentle reminder, you know what, we can't do that. We're going to have to pull mm -hmm. away now. We've spent enough time, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's some really important elements there. Uh, but, mm. but we need to work together to bring it all together in that kind of way. Mm. And, and the one thing... The stakeholders, <laughs> sorry, the stakeholders sorry. that we have at this table have been... You know, this is vitally, a, it's a start, but I think we need to get more and more stakeholders around the table when we can get there and, you know, and discuss the reality of, of and agree on the reality of what is happening. And, and as you say, Jonathan, there's <coughs> well-respected lodges out there <coughs> that do not behave in accordance to what they, they should be doing. Yeah. And, and it's, it's just, it, it blows my mind that they can they can actually not even be considered because they're just chasing the 
the greenback and not be considered about the environment. And I, I don't know. So, yeah. mm. I think the, yeah. the one interesting thing that's come out of us kind of putting out this when the Mara, I mean, with the rains and COVID and the whole thing, and us going kind of public and saying, guys, we need to make a difference. It's been kind of humbling and just amazing in a way to see the amount of people that want to help. And I'm not just talking the people who have been there, who have been to the Triangle and have been to the Masamara and they've experienced the East African magic. They all want to support and they again and again, and it's been unbelievable. But there's also a very big, um, a big group of people out there who have never been. We know they haven't been because they keep on saying, I want to, I want to. So there is a big chunk of the international community that is aware of what we are trying to save and they want to make a difference. And that to me gives me hope. We, we need to somehow get into that. I, I think the, the, one thing that's, the one thing that is incredibly special about the Mara, and I've worked in a couple of landscapes across Africa, Asia, South America, I have never come across one reserve that has got such a following. Mm. There are so many people who come to this reserve, not just once a year, but every, every six months. Like, that's incredible. I mean, I love the Sabi Sands in South Africa. It's where I kind of started my whole guiding career. But I wouldn't know it's one of those landscapes that is just, it's just one of those landscapes and it has that following that is just spectacular online. And it is harnessing that, that little family. It's a big family. And it's getting yeah. those people to talk. And what's wonderful is that we're sitting here and we're from different, we're from different camps and there, there's no, no point in us competing. We're not, we're not competing for the same bed night. We, we need to realize, we need to switch that pyramid. Like I was saying, we need to realize that if the Mara does well, then Ngama and Wild Eye and all other guys do well. But it's pointless us, us fighting for, for the individual bed. And I hope, I hope that that doesn't happen um, in these months to come. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, I, I think I think it would be maybe handy just to talk very quickly about the Great Amara, because if mm -hmm. the Amara, the, the Masamara National Game Reserve, 1,500 square kilometers, people say, and it sounds a little bit bigger than perhaps it is, that the Great Amara, so the reserve, the wildlife conservancies, and areas beyond the wildlife conservancies where wildlife still roam. So the Mara ecosystem, maybe mm -hmm. 6,000, 5, 6,000 square kilometers. I think we need to be very careful here about people who think that, you know, the wildlife conservancies, and, and again, we let, let's just remind people, the Mara Conservancy is a management company running that part of the reserve on the west side of the Mara River, which we call the Mara Triangle. The wildlife conservancies we're referring to, the 16 functional ones, border the reserve, mainly on the sort of north and eastern side of the reserve, private land, deal with tour operators, camps and lodges, a more sustainable, friendly model for the environment. But I think we need to be, we need to try, and I know various people in the different aspects in the reserve, in the conservancies, private landowners, we need again, rather like with the tour operators and the guides and the, the, the mm -hmm. sort of input in trying to come up with something which works for the Mara, we need to think about the big picture. Because people who think that, that the wildlife conservancies are the answer on their own, they're a wonderful addition, but they won't survive if the reserve doesn't survive. So we have to nurture the whole of the Mara. We have to take examples and benefits and things that are working from the way the Mara Conservancy runs the Mara Triangle and adopt those on the other side of the river as well. But mm -hmm. with the Mara Conservancies, yeah, fantastic. And for those people who say, but I, you know, I've been to the Mara, I've been to the reserve, you know, there were too many cars and vehicles, you have an alternative, which is you can go, and of course you'll be helping in a very direct way because the money will be going much more directly to the landowners who are the Maasai community, who own the land on which the camps and lodges in the wildlife conservancies are, mm. then by staying there, you will be less of you. You will have a, an experience which you will not be sharing with so many people. And mm. you can pride yourself on the fact your, 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 your money is going directly, some of it, 
to the local community, to the landlords, the landowners, and mm -hmm. you can feel that, you know, you're really contributing and have, a, you know, a quieter, more environmentally friendly um, opportunity in doing that. But let's not ever th think that we should just say, you know what, you know, if the reserve is not managed as well as we'd like to see it, but we're hoping it will be, it'll adopt the practices of the Myra Conservancy, let's not just say, well, then fine, don't worry about what's happening there. We've got the wildlife conservancies, the private land. No, we, the reserve, link to the Serengeti. So we're between the wildlife conservancies to the north and east of us and the Serengeti, eight times bigger, to the south of us. We mm -hmm. must nurture the reserve and we must do everything we can to encourage good practice and, and obviously, the, you know, try and create a visitor experience, which is amazing and which it can be without mm. damaging the environment. And I think Adam's point, you know, the environment is the bedrock. It's like nature. We can't live yeah. without nature. Nature is everything. That's what now global climate change, pandemics, <laughs> you know, um, global warming, uh, loss of biodiversity. You know, this is the earth. This is Mother Nature saying, ouch, you know, pay attention and hopefully. Yeah. This whole period will create a new normal, not let's get back to the old one. Something that was quite, was quite incredible in the last few months was, was being able to see the Mara rejuvenate. Yeah. Um, and and I, I had a number of times where I'd be driving along and it, the, 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 it was just so wet. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to leave this area and I'm going to mm. leave it for a month. I'm not going to go anywhere near it and just see, and then I'll go to the same tree and watch it regrow and, and, and see the grasses. And it's just, it has been a huge breath of fresh air for the Mara in so many ways as well. So although there's a lot of, there is a lot of doom and gloom and there is a lot of difficulties economically. Um, mm -hmm. When I look at the Mara now, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And that it has no, it has had no one in it. Um, and it's but Adam, the, did, yeah. you, did you perhaps, Adam, did you perhaps see that Thailand on finding that nature, you know, animals are coming back. We're seeing this all over the world. They're coming back into urban areas or whatever it is. Thailand have said, you know, it's so wonderful to see nature recovering that actually we're going to close our wilderness and protected areas for two months, which is what they've done for two months every year. And of course, you in Southern Africa and in certain places, Zambia, I know they close down some of those areas. Uh, yeah. seasonally so so you know maybe maybe that's something also one needs to think about that you know if we can't if we're going to have lots of people at certain times then let's have a part of the time when there's less people and of course that plays right into the question which i would always say to people now some of my favorite times to be in the mara are in what we'd call the off season you know we yeah. could fill you know, we can add a lot of extra bed nights in the rainy season when people think, oh, you know, we've got to come. Now it's all about the migration. Let's come between July and, and you know, October. No, I would come mm. any other time than that. Yes, okay, yeah. see it. But I want to be there when the grass, like you've seen it, harder to get round, but photographically and as yeah. an experience, the Phenomenal. best. Uh, just, there's, a, there's a comment here from Cheryl saying, I have to throw this out as someone who went to the Mara and off season. It was incredible in capitals. And I have absolutely no desire to go during high season to see the migration. There's so, so much more to see than the river crossings. Yes. That's what it's about. It's, it's, there's so much more. It's beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. I, well, yeah. go, on, go ahead, Adam. No, I was just saying, as a, as a photographer, and because it's a photo photo photographer's forum, really, like having seen the last few months un unfold, I tell you, April and May were spectacular. I mean, I, the, the scenes of the, of the water and the river and just the greenery, it was difficult. It was difficult for wildlife um, yeah. and the roads were difficult. Um, but if you, if, you, if you find that you, you were taking off your big lens and putting on your, on your wide angle lens, then photography suddenly became a dream. Um, so yeah, the Mara has got different times to suit different people, I think. Yeah, and I, th I think that's a great point because suddenly you're not a wildlife photographer, you're a landscape photographer. And actually, exactly. it's one of the things, yeah, isn't it one of the things that when we take photographers out, of course, everybody gets excited once the big shot of the lion, the cheetah, the action takes loads of portraits. I know ourselves, when we look through, you know, our portfolio of images, I'm always thinking, why aren't we taking more landscape pictures? Because the Mara landscape with those big skies and of course the Mara triangle, 
having the escarpment of the backdrop, yeah, the backdrop. You know, oh, you've no, got Ngorongora no. crater with even better wildlife. Yeah. Uh, no, that's what we always say to clients, and I'm not a photographic facilitator, but you know, get the animal in its environment, and you know, um, some of the stuff that's been coming out of Gaba that was with the, you know, like the giraffe is yay big. You've got the horizon, these magnificent, huge skies, dramatic, cloudy skies. That to me mm. encapsulates the Mara and says a lot more in the story of the image than if you get a tight portrait of a lion or yeah. the left lion on a branch. You know, that could be anywhere. So it's an important point of telling the story of. I think from um, including the environment in your image as well. Absolutely. Mm. And, and in fact, I know it's government policy. I know the Ministry of Tourism, you know, has wanted the tourist industry as a whole in terms of diversifying the product, has wanted to try and get away from this idea of, you know, the Mara is just about the migration. No, it isn't. It's just about mm. being this incredible wilderness area landscape. And of course, the big cats, you know, territorial by the cheetahs, but the lions and leopards, you know, they're in their territories year round. It's the resident prey which controls their numbers, not the migration. When that goes, they stay put, you know, unless they're nomads. So you're always going to have great big cat sightings, but you're going to probably see it in incredible landscapes. And it'll be a lot easier to photograph because you won't have three or four other cars driving into your shop. Mm. Yeah. There's another comment here from Val saying, she went with wildlife to the Mara crossings. The crossings were amazing, but the best times were when we were away from the open areas with no other people and the landscape was more amazing. So it just echoes everything we're saying. It's, it's, yeah. For those people that are watching this live or on YouTube later on, I mean, it's real. You have to check out the Mara. Jonathan, when are you getting back to the Mara? You know, funny, I, just as an aside, I've just written, uh, or we've, Angie and I've just written an article on Scarface that, the, you know, Adam will know, all of you will know all about him, uh, you know, who's in the twilight of his life. He's nearly 13 now. And uh, who knows whether he's even still alive somewhere in all that long grass, uh, because he won't be here forever. So we've written, I think we've got about 10 pages in the August issue of BBC Wildlife on Scarface, the real Lion King. Oh, wow. And okay. um, so, you know, in some ways, because, you know, with the new book to write and, and getting other sort of, you know, things going, it's actually been quite productive. You know, if I'm in the Mara, I never want to be in camp. I never want to be writing and doing stuff like that. Yeah. I want to be out in the field, which is what you want everybody else to do. But a couple of points I just want to make. You know, the Mara is the most extraordinary place. You will not find a better place to see all three big cats, which is why for 12 years we did Big Cat Diary there, because the tricky one, the leopards, from Half Tail in 96 and Zawadi or Shadow, through to more recent times, you know, leopards are easy to find in the Mara, sometimes easier than cheetahs. And the wildlife conservancies outside the reserve are incredible for leopard and cheetahs at this time because of the more, you know, more bush, less open, easier mm -hmm. for them, you know, raise their cubs. But a couple of warning sounds here, because as incredible as the Mara is, and we never want to hear bad news, but I think we have to. And so in our article, we've raised a couple of issues. One, Scarface, one of the musketeers, four male lions, like Notch and his boys, six male lions, five, was well, six at one point, <coughs> in a coalition. The six warriors, who I think, uh, whatever people call them, the Marsh Pride males, which I think five of them came over to the triangle, Adam Post. I think that's what he was talking about. These big coalitions of male lions are not the norm. And the reason we're seeing them, based on the studies from the Mara Predator Conservation Program, is because there is less nomadic males, the young males that are pushed out of their pride, two, two and a half years, three years of age, become nomads, four or five years of age, hopefully get, can take over a territory for themselves. The Mara is such a, a sort of lion haven that, of course, when mm. you're young and struggling, you're always in somebody's territory. So you get pushed to the edges, and the edges are where people are, and it's where cattle is. And, of course, with so many cattle at one point coming into the reserve, there was a lot of attrition on the lion. So those young males who were mm. looking for food, and also what was interesting, so they were getting killed. Not all of them, but some of them. Less nomads 
That's why you've got these big male lower coalitions. In the old days, a coalition would stay in a pride. If they got two, three years, they were done because there was movement always of new males coming in. Secondly, because those males like Scarface are staying for, he's been a pride male now for six or seven years in various prides, some of them for six years continuously. A lioness is mature enough to have cubs at four. They're gonna be breeding with their dad or their uncle or a relative if they stay in the pride. Now, normally females try and stay in the pride. Again, the researchers are finding young groups of females, which happens sometimes if there's mm -hmm. too many females in the pride, you know, be, and there's not enough food, not enough denning sites, would emigrate, but it's happening more commonly. Again, because they're trying to seemingly avoid breeding with their male, you know, the adult males, which are their fathers, uncles, whatever. So that's one thing. So definitely we see smaller prides, still an amazing place for lions, but there is an impact going on. So we shouldn't think that we can get away with the cattle situation without actually killing the golden goose. If it's for lions and it's a protected area, make a choice. Is it cows or is it lions? Mm -hmm. Secondly, secondly, and this is very important, the wildebeest migration, Mara Serengeti, for years has been around 1.3 million animals. And it stayed pretty stable at that, dry seasons, wet seasons, up and down a bit, pretty much that. The researchers and Joseph Agutu, who studied lions in the 90s, and his colleagues have done a lot of work on wildlife throughout Kenya. That migration is still at the stable number, but guess what? We used to get about 600,000, half the migration, in the Mara, spilling up into the Mara and into the wildlife conservancies, staying for about four months. So the dry season, July through to October, half mm -hmm. the migration. The latest data from them says we're down to 157,000 and they are staying on average and you could still be seeing wildebeest throughout the dry season, but they're staying on average for half the length of time they did before. Less grass and then you've got the whole issue that Jono and Adam know about, which is the drying up of the Mara River, which is a mm -hmm. real concern. Because even though it broke its banks this year, let's not get carried away. The, situation of the Mara River is a serious concern. Mm. Yeah, if, if, you sure. compare, if, you compare, if you compare the river this year to the river last year, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And, I, and um, it's easy to think that it's a very healthy system if you look at it now, because the river is still very high. Um, but if, if you look at photographs taken exactly now, you know, tw 12 months ago, it's a, it's a very, very mm. different story. And, and also, Adam, Adam, don't you reckon that that massive rain, even though we had very heavy rains, we all know that if you're clearing trees, which we know is happening in the Mal Forest, and they're trying to put a stop to it, but sure. deforestation, deforestation allows a river to just flood and, and come down in the way it does far more easily, doesn't it? And it takes all yeah. the topsoil with it. So, so very, very interesting observation from the last four months is that in the Mara, I have seen more hippo fights resulting in dead hippos than I've seen in my entire rest of my career anywhere. And I put it down to the fact that the river is changing levels so quickly that what, what is perfect for a hippo today is gonna to be too deep for them tomorrow. So all these hippos are having to congregate often outside the river mm -hmm. um, and then they fight. And there's, I mean, I think I've seen eight, eight dead hippos in the last three months, which is a, a high number for one guy driving around in a car. Um, but I think it's because the fluctuations are so extreme that you, it can drop three meters in a night. Um, it's, it's a very, very strange river. <laughs> it's a beautiful river, but it's strange. Yes. <laughs> How much impact does um, take off out of the river um, between the Mar Forest say, and the Mara? Is there, is there research on, is it totally due to deforestation in the Mar Forest or is it is a lot to do with takeoff uh, for farming um, along the along the river between before so we from, get to the from, from what from what i understand it's it's both um there's massive deforestation in the mile but they are trying i flew over there not too long ago and they have planted a lot of trees they are trying yeah. um but there are also a lot of farms between the mile and the start of the kind of the conservancy start of the triangle area and i don't think there's any monitoring of how much water they're they're pulling out so i'd say it's Losing a combination there, yeah. of both 
But, but you know, an, an interesting thing, and, and I was just reading up about it. So the Kenya and Tanzania government, because of course the Mara is a shared river, like the Mara Serengeti shares the migration, the Mara River rises in the Mau Escarpment, which was Kenya's or is Kenya's largest indigenous forest. I think it was about 4,000 square kilometers at one point. Uh, the river comes down from a swamp in the Mau Escarpment through the Mara into the Serengeti and empties into Lake Victoria. So it's shared between Kenya and Tanzania. And because of the falling level, Kenya and Tanzania got together and were going to put in two dams, one in Kenya and a second one in Tanzania. But because the ecologists and the people looking at the potential impact on the levels of the river and whether, because the idea of the dams was that actually it would help to regulate the flow of the river so that there was more water available to be let down the river in the dry season when it dries up to a trickle or has at times in years. But apparently mm. Tanzania, based on the ecological warnings they were saying were, were being blown, you know, they were being warned about, has since shelved the idea of their dam and has asked Kenya to do likewise. Kenya has responded by saying, the Tanzanians are playing tricky with the evidence and that they were going to go ahead. But I think for the moment it's on hold, but it's a, it's a hugely controversial thing because obviously if it's for the right reason, which isn't, it's not for hydroelectric power or anything like that. It was opposed apparently to help with maintaining the flow with a lowered volume. And as Adam mm -hmm. says, there's been reforestation. Although I think I don't know if it was there or whether it's bamboo or whatever it is, you know, it's not necessarily indigenous trees, but great if there is, and we know there is some reforestation. But the other thing that we hear about the river is that there's quite a high level of pollution now, because obviously, as Adam said, there's a huge influx of people into these Maasai areas because it's the last of the land available to people in Lake Victoria region. You know, land has been subdivided between fathers brothers, you know, sons, and so people are land hungry. So it's not just Maasai who have moved into the Mara region, it's people also from the Lake Basin, and there's just tremendous pressure, as Adam said, 10% immigration it is basically into the area, <laughs> because everybody sees potential. Sure. No, oh, there's something else, eh? Sure. Yeah. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> there's, but you know, there's, there's a, this, uh, I, I think Adam will have seen this. I, I was at the launch of this paper, um, but it's a, a World Bank report, when good conservation becomes good economics, which talks about the benefits to a country like Kenya of wildlife-based tourism. And of course, you know, the wildlife conservancy movement, I think uh, Cynthia Moss said it was the biggest innovation in terms of a conservation priority in you know, giving people a reason to protect their land because mm. um, they could make money for wildlife. Because, of course, unlike Southern Africa, we don't go in for consumptive use of wildlife. So we're not hunting mm -hmm. it. We're not game ranching it, which we did and used to. And as I said, it was banned in 77. We've never gone back that route. And a lot of people feel, well, the donors are very much pro wildlife based sustainable based you know as in tourism as opposed to consuming it but in the meantime some people will say to us that kenya you know has lost 60 70 percent of its wildlife across the board in the last 40 years and repeats the pattern that we see worldwide of this massive loss in biodiversity which means that places like the mara are not only extraordinary and unique but it's a mm. miracle that places like this still survive and we have to say a big thank you to the maasai and to kenya that we've got these kind of places that we can come and enjoy and and there lies like, a, very, a very interesting um, another just another point that i often think about is <laughs> the world the world comes to the mara and there's so if you look at if you if you if you do your research about the different countries about the, the mega diverse countries in terms of biodiversity you'll find that the vast, vast majority of them are from these, these developing countries, from these countries that are struggling for, for money. Mm -hmm. and, and the countries that are all super well off and you know, they've already destroyed their wildlife, but yet they depend on, on the developing countries' wildlife. And I think that maybe the time is coming when, when the, the burden of the, the costs need to be 
need to be shared a bit more. I don't know how you do that again. It's, it's not, not an easy one to do, but, but we've got this incredible thing that people enjoy from all over the world, but then they expect the Maasai to look after and the Kenya to look after and Tanzania or whatever. And yeah, it's, it just seems that that's, that's a bit of an old fashioned kind of way of thinking, but yeah. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, you could do two things, couldn't you? You could raise park fees, like you were saying, make it more expensive because it's such an extraordinary experience and privilege to come to places like this. But basically, really, every country should, you know, even if it's a dollar a person, you know, worldwide, there should be a conservation tax. I remember George Schaller, you know, the wonderful yeah. zoologist, studied Serengeti lions, tigers, leopards, you know, he was the zoologist we'd all love to be, incredible conservationist. When he was asked, well, who's going to pay? He said, the world should be paying. He said, and this was during the Iraq war, he said, America spends more in a week in Iraq than it does on its whole environmental program in yeah. a week. It's ridiculous. And, mm, yeah. and hopefully, hopefully this pandemic will get nature, like Adam said, <coughs> all about the environment whether it's protecting the mara you've got to start mm. with the product and the product isn't tourism the product is the mara yeah. and we should protect it whether we have tourists or not but we, yeah. we obviously we want you know people to come back when it's safe yeah and, and you know I, I think what the pandemic might have done is i know the people we speak to um, as past people who have traveled with us they can't wait to get out there but they're wanting to get out there almost with a renewed sense of awe of the place because it, it's, been, it's been such a recalibration of how we see ourselves and what we do for our off time on this that people are thinking of, wow, I can get back to the Mara. And I've spoken to quite a few where, where the moment that door opens or you, you get out the car or you get out the plane and you're there again, that moment to those that have been there is quite something. But I also think with, with the way people have consumed media and the bad news that's been going around for the last 12 weeks, whatever it might have been, People are looking, and people who haven't been to the Mara are looking to places like this. We're getting people joining webinars and asking questions and commenting more on images because they're looking for something good, something real. And, and I just hope that we can connect those people to the Mara because that, that's the link, is those new eyeballs, the new passion, new people caring, new, new funds coming in. That, 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 that I'm hoping we can pull through this whole thing. Mm. Yeah, so um, guys, let's go around the table once. Well, just last one to wrap this up. For those of you that have been listening, thank you so much. There's quite a few comments. What we're going to do is this is going on to YouTube. We'll share it out through all the social media platforms. I'll put links to everybody's websites and contact addresses and Instagrams in there as well. Should you have any further, further questions or comments? Um, just kind of a last word around the table. Adam, anything from you? Oh, I, I just, it's, I've, Again, I can't stress how incredibly lucky I've been to have been literally the only person in the, in the Mara for the last four months. And for me, the <laughs> highlight has been for me the highlight has been watching the lion dynamics unfold. Like um, I've I've obviously spent months in, in places before, but I've never actually gone out almost probably five or six days a week for the last four months and watched the families of lions changing. And and Johnny, Johnny, you and all people will know about how lion dynamics become so close to one's heart. But to have watched during, during my time here, I've actually watched an entire coalition change um, with these bitter shaka males that have come in and pushed Scar. I haven't seen, I've seen Scar once in the beginning of lockdown. Um, whether he's alive, I don't know. But his, he's lost his land. <laughs> um, and so every single morning, I've been going to the same area and just watching this magic unfold. And so my thing about tourism going forward is hopefully people will come for longer. Hopefully people will travel less. They'll, they'll no longer just go ding, 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 shoot around the country, yeah. shoot around Africa. Those jet, jet trips that travel around the world, a couple of days in each destination, hopefully, hopefully they'll fade out and you'll start to see these Slow guys down. Who, yeah, embed a lot of time. Maybe, maybe we'll see six nights, ten nights happening in, in one destination. That, that's what I hope comes out of it. 100%. 100%. Jono, anything from your side? Just no, I, I, wrap I, I, up. I, um, Adam, I echo your sentiments 100%. Uh, somebody made a comment um, on the Q&A. It's about not necessarily the, um, the travel. It's the, the, the number of airports that people are going to have to go through and the number of flights. Um, so people ordinarily would come to East Africa, to Kenya, then Uganda, then Tanzania. Lots of airplanes, lots of flights, lots of airports where... 
where I think people are, as, as I said earlier, they want to reconnect with nature. And is, is there any place in the world to reconnect with nature better than the Mara? I haven't been there. I haven't been to a lot no. of places. But, and, and I think that's the important point that we need to sell Mara as a destination of really mm. going back to nature. It's almost like you're immersing your soul back into nature and going from this highly pressurized time of COVID, corona, whatever, and lockdowns and deaths and cases, whatever, going into an environment where you can totally switch off. And I've always thought that about the Mara. Um, mm. you, can, you can switch off, you can um, reconnect. And as you say, going for longer periods with family, with friends, and really enjoying the environment and um, taking a whole new perspective on life back, you know, yeah. back home. Just, um, Jonathan, just before I ask you, just the last one here from Cheryl. Cheryl says, thanks for the really exciting webinar. As an ecologist, wildlife photographer, and lifelong fan of East Africa and the wildlife, I really appreciate learning about tourism, its impact on conservation, and vice versa. Now, we're talking about education. Um, Cheryl will be doing a presentation to her parents' retirement community sometimes in the next couple of months, um, and we'll be mentioning the tourism conservation issues. Cannot wait to get back to the Mara. That's what it's about. It's... It's about people learning, understanding, and carrying on the message. Cheryl, that's amazing. Thank you. Jonathan, anything from you, just to kind of wrap it up? Yeah, I, I mean, I think what I would say is, uh, you know, what I've been so privileged to do, and, and Angie, is, is to spend, like Adam's now just done, you know, quality time with, in our case, the big cats, which we could recognize. We didn't <coughs> think of them as our friends. We loved the fact that they were individual, unique creatures but they were individuals that we could recognize mm. and they became part of a narrative. They became part of a soap opera. And as was said earlier, the thing that defines the Mara is that there is a whole world. There's, there's people out there all over the world who are constantly thinking about the Mara and its big cats and its animals, all of them. But when it comes to the big cats, they, they you know, whether it's Scarface, whether it was Notch, you'll have people in tears just talking about these animals. When I mistakenly thought Scara died, you know, at the end of the last year. <laughs> and, you know, because it was I, I burst into tears when I read that. Oh my God. <laughs> people, people were suicidal. And uh, so I think what, you know, this is a unique place. There's nowhere else in the world that I know of. I know other people in other places, other game reserves, they monitor their cats and stuff. But one of the great things we feel so, so pleased with Big Cat Diary was it brought the experience and made it a very individual experience. People come now and they want to see the five cheetah boys or they want to see, yeah. you know, the warriors. So I'm not saying that has, that has to be why you come, but what it does is help to underline what I think we said before, which is these are real living breathing animals they are individuals in their own right they're magnificent creatures we shouldn't just turn it into entertainment even if it is entertainment watching them but we should be respectful and we should realize that it is an absolute privilege and as i've always yeah. said to spend you know if i had one day left jono said the same i'm sure adam saw you two you know angie and i we'd spend it in the mara there is yep. no one like it and it's something that everybody should experience at least once in a lifetime. Couldn't agree more. I was speaking to someone recently and spoke about favorite trips and Mara comes up. And when we spoke about why, it, it grounds you. It's the people, it's the vastness thereof, it's the big skies. It's, it's just, it's, it, it grounds you. It is such an amazing thing. Guys, thank you so very much for your time. Um, again, for everybody watching on YouTube, and on the live version, this will be up. You look in the comments and the caption for details. Link up with Adam, with Jonathan, with Jono. If you have any questions, if you want to support us, please get in touch. We're trying to make a difference to this incredible ecosystem. But um, maybe we do this again. We'll see how we go. Guys, thank you so very much. In Nairobi, good night. Mara, cheers. Jono, thank you so much. Guys, we'll be in touch. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers, Adam. Bye-bye.